Uh, so we're going we're gonna to do a, a few talks on point-of-care ultrasound. Uh, most of this relates to the ICU, but also um, hospitalist medicine is growing uh, with, uh, as far as using ultrasound for diagnostic and for uh, physical exam purposes. So uh, we'll go through all of that. <clears throat> and uh, in this there are probably three, three parts uh, to this talk. Um, what's, uh, what's going on there? John, as soon as you put a, uh, some food in your mouth. Anyone else? Yeah, so uh, looks like the heart doesn't squeeze very well, right? So uh, um, this is a subcostal short axis of the heart. Um, that left ventricle is displayed here, and then the right ventricle is tiny up top. Um, compared this to this one, which is something we see more commonly in the ICU, uh, which we would call a hyperdynamic state, uh, and you can see that the LV almost squeezes out everything that it fills up with. Uh, so that's an important uh, part of the physical exam almost uh, for um, uh, when we're in the ICU. Um, so things we'll go through today, um, talk about um, the history of ultrasound very briefly, um, ultrasound physics, um, what the knobs do on an ultrasound machine, um, different transducer probes, how to use uh, the movements and what the nomenclature is for the movements and maneuvers that we do with probes, uh, and then the meat of this that I want the first years at least uh, and the second years to take away is probe control and how to control your needle and your ultrasound probe um, uh, when you're doing procedures. Um, in the future, we'll talk about some um, procedural stuff, so thoracentesis, paracentesis, uh, diagnosing pleural effusions, diagnosing pericardial effusions, uh, doing some basic echocardiography, uh, and then some lung ultrasound and vascular ultrasound as well. So those probably be in the future. Um, to start off with, uh, so, so ultrasound started off as a diagnostic tool. It was a hands of radiologist. Uh, we would order a test, they would do it, the radiologist would read it, give us a report on it, and we weren't really in tune with looking at images of an ultrasound. Uh, and when I was in medical school, looking at ultrasound images was almost Greek to me. I would have no idea what I'm looking at. Um, it's grown quite a bit into, at least in critical care and then ER and hospitalist medicine, where we use ultrasound quite a bit for diagnostic purposes as well as for helping with procedures. Um, the most important thing for me, at least, is that it extends my physical exam. So if I can feel something in a human body, I can put a probe on it and characterize it better. Um, so to give you an example of something like that that we learned in medical school, I have probably not done that in the last three years. Um, I don't know if you guys have or not, but to replace that or to add to that physical exam um, maneuver, you can do an ultrasound of the kidneys and you can see what the kidneys look like if you feel that they're enlarged. The same with uh, something like this that we, uh, you know, we see people with ascites pretty often and doing a fluid thrill is something that we would elicit. Easier than that is put a probe on them and you can find how much fluid they have and also find a pocket so that you can tap them. Um, percussing for pleural effusions. I think the only physician I know who works at the VA that I won't mention is the only person who does percussion for pleural effusions when an ultrasound is in the same room. Um, but, you know, an ultrasound can tell you a lot. It can tell you what you have in there. It can even tell you the differential for what the fluid is. Anyone know what that uh, last picture is there? This guy? Homan sign. sign. What is that for? DVT. So I've never seen anyone do a Homan sign for a DVT. But we do order duplexes all the time, and that's something that we can do ourselves uh, at the bedside. So these are things that, you know, we, uh, we um, physical exam maneuvers that we perform very often that we can have ultrasound help as an adjunct to better characterize uh, what we see on um, ultrasound. And then uh, the application of ultrasound is almost for every subspecialty you have out there. Um, you know, GI, critical care, um, cardiology, primary care, rheumatology, Every, almost every subspecialty uses ultrasound. I think the only two I can think of that don't is ID and palliative care. So um, other than that, every other specialty is, is using ultrasound for one reason or the other. Um, before we get started, just some, some housekeeping. Uh, try to take care of the ultrasound. Um, don't let the probes dangle like that. Uh, those probes are very expensive. Uh, these machines help us a lot when we need them. When someone's crashing and burning, we get lots of valuable information out of doing an ultrasound on patients. So we've got to protect these machines and keep them uh, clean and keep them um, well. So uh, moving on to the um, history of ultrasound. Does anyone know what echolocation is or what, uh, what animal uses echolocation? Bats. Bats. So this concept of seeing or seeing using sound waves is, is actually coming from bats, where a bat will emit uh, a click, clicking noise, uh, 
And then that bounces back to the bat and it tells them if there are any, you know, um, things around where they're flying. So this keeps them from crashing into things while they're flying around. Uh, and we use a similar concept in, um, in critical care ultrasound or, or regular ultrasound as well. Um, just to go back to um, the 1980s, so piezoelectricity, it's a concept that if you have piezoelectric crystals and you compress them or put pressure to them, they generate an electric current. And the opposite is true as well. So if you charge a piezoelectric crystal with electricity, it will change shape and it will emit sound waves. And those are the sound waves we use uh, to, to use our ultrasound beam that the transducer picks up after that. Now, um, in 1942, Dr. Dusik, uh, he was a neurologist from Vienna. He started using ultrasound uh, to um, diagnose brain tumors. But this is not the ultrasound we use today. This was, it looks something like that. And that's called A mode, amplitude mode. To give you an example of what that corresponds to, that's the B mode image that it corresponds to. So if you try to make sense of an A mode image, it's very hard, difficult to use for diagnostic purposes. And that's changed very significantly since the advent of B mode, which is what we use uh, most commonly um, in, in ultrasound. Um, moving on, there, were, there was a radiologist, uh, Dr. Howery, and then Dr. Ohms, who was a nephrologist. They actually pioneered uh, B-mode, and, and this made it move forward. But their ultrasound machine pretty much looked like laundry equipment. So they, they had a huge tub. Uh, they put a patient into the huge tub, and then there was lots of machines, lots of dials, and there's a small little screen that you can see on there um, was where they would see the image of a B-mode. So we've come a long, long way uh, from A-mode and, and Dr. Howery and Dr. Ohms, uh, where now we have very compact mobile uh, ultrasound machines with much better resolution, the ability to save images, the ability uh, to, to teach with those save, uh, by saving those images. Um, and then moving even forward, you've got handheld devices. So now in the future, I'm pretty sure in the next 10 years, you'll have physicians who have pocket uh, ultrasound machines in their white coats that they're going to pull out and use as a physical exam adjunct. Um, so that, that's going to be very exciting uh, going forwards. So moving on to um, ultrasound physics, uh, this is the spectrum of frequency of sound, uh, sound waves. Um, anyone know where human hearing lies? Come on, guys. 22? 20. 20,000, good. So this is where we hear, right? Everything beyond 20,000 is ultrasonic. Um, so these very low uh, things that are close to 20 hertz are your very low bass tones. Um, things that are just above what we can hear is what animals use uh, to, to perform echolocation and things like those. Uh, a little higher than that is used for therapeutic purposes, things like physiotherapy, um, for cosmetic reasons. Uh, and then diagnostic ultrasound comes... Um, all the way to much higher uh, frequency of, of those sound waves. So that's pretty much where we uh, live with a diagnostic ultrasound machine. Um, it's important to know how images are synthesized on an ultrasound machine. So um, when you have, uh, this is my depiction of the human body, uh, when you put an ultrasound probe in it, or on it, it emits uh, these ultrasound waves. And those uh, ultrasound waves can either bounce back or not and be reflected and be uh, visualized uh, as an image. Um, if you put an object in there um, that partially reflects back those waves, you'll get sort of a gray image. Uh, if you put in uh, a very solid object, you'll see all of them getting reflected and you'll see a much brighter image. Uh, and then the other thing that a transducer is doing is trying to figure out what the distance is uh, by knowing how fast those waves bounce back. So if you move that object a lot closer uh, to the ultrasound machine, it'll bounce back a lot quicker. So this is important to know echogenicity. So um, if something is isoechoic, it'll be that, that gray semi-solid object that we talked about with some waves uh, bouncing back, some waves still being conducted through it. Um, this is an image of um, the subcostal two chamber and what's pointed out with the arrow over there is actually the liver. So liver echotexture is isoechoic or um, uh, similar to that. Uh, myocardium looks similar to that as well. Um, that left ventricle in the center um, has got lots of hypoechoic areas. That's blood. So blood uh, is hypoechoic and allows waves to pass through completely without getting reflected. Um, and then if you look at the pericardium, uh, which is hyperechoic, uh, those are being reflected almost all, um, all of them. So that's how a uh, transducer is actually making sense of an image and getting you uh, that B-mode image. Uh, 
The other important thing to remember is that the ultrasound probe will only uh, be able to get a good image if those waves are bouncing back to the transducer. So if you look at the two in the center, um, those have ultrasound waves bouncing uh, back completely to the transducer. You get a very good image or strong echoes. Um, the ones are, that are on the sides uh, are not getting back the entire um, sound, sound waves that are being transmitted, and so you get a much weaker image. So there are two things that will optimize your image. One is to get rid of artifact, and we'll talk about that very, very soon. And the other one is to, to use fine movements on your ultrasound probe so that you can get most of your sound waves to bounce back onto your probe. Um, so the first interface we'll talk about is a water-water interface. So the first water is, is ultrasound gel that's on the skin, and the second water is, is that pleural fluid that's in there. So this is an image uh, of, um, of a patient's chest, a thorax, uh, that shows pleural fluid in there. It shows uh, the diaphragm to the right, uh, and it shows part of the lung to the left. Um, this is, uh, again, uh, the reason I'm a big fan of ultrasound. So can, you, can you guys appreciate debris in there, in that fluid? Uh, at, the, at the bottom, there's sort of hazy, wavy uh, sort of appearance. So this is an exudative effusion. It was actually a malignant effusion that came back cytology positive. So not only is ultrasound letting you know that there's an effusion there, it's also telling you what that effusion is from or give you a rough idea of what your next step would be to manage this patient. Um, the other interface is water-air. Um, so this is a ultrasound uh, probe that was placed on the chest. And so there are two artifacts that you can see in this. Uh, one are these uh, rep repetitive lines that are on the left. Uh, they're kind of interspaced equally, and those are called A-lines. Uh, that's um, when uh, water, air has an interface, and it keeps reflecting again and again, and the image uh, that's formed, it's, it, the ultrasound probe is thinking that it's getting reflected multiple times. That's why you see multiple lines in there. Um, A-lines are a good finding, so if you're looking for pleural fluid, and you see the diaphragm, and you see A-lines right next to it, you're probably very safe to say that there's no pleural fluid. There are very minimal pleural fluid. The other artifact you see on there are B-lines. And B-lines are uh, a finding, if you see a lot of them, uh, they're a finding for alveolar interstitial syndrome, things like pulmonary edema, ARDS, uh, fibrosis, things like those. So um, very valuable. In fact, a um, uh, couple weekends, or last weekend, I think, I was at the VA, and we had a, McKesson was not working, uh, so we had a, a chest x-ray that we couldn't see. It wasn't red. Uh, so we put an ultrasound probe on a patient. We, tried, we figured out that he had B-lines bilaterally. That's consistent with cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Uh, we did an, a bedside echo on him, found his EF was about 10%. And so we, we got useful information, even we didn't have a chest x-ray on us. But we started treatment on this patient with diuretics and, and other things that we needed to. So very useful. Um, the last interface I want to talk about is water bone. So anything that has a very high density, bone, calcium, anything similar to that, will not allow uh, you to see anything um, in the far field. So anything after that bone uh, on, the, on, on the two sides of uh, the plural line uh, marked by the red arrows, you can't see anything below them because there are ribs over there. This is, by the way, an image of lung sliding. So you put uh, your vascular probe uh, in between an intercostal space, and that white line that you see that kind of slides is actually the visceral and parietal pleura that are sliding against each other. If you find this and you're suspecting a pneumothorax, you're probably comfortable saying you don't have a pneumothorax, at least up there. Um, question so far? Okay. So uh, moving on to knobology, just knowing what does what on an ultrasound machine. Uh, this is the old ultrasound machine we used to have at, at UofL. We still have a similar version of this at the VA. Uh, so it's, it's good to know uh, both machines. I'll talk about both of them. Um, so uh, the newer machine that we have at UofL, uh, there's a touch screen, and the touch screen looks something similar to this. This is where all the knobs are now. So uh, we'll go through that. The first thing I want to talk about is changing transducers. So there are at least three transducers on each um, ultrasound machine we have at U of L, and and two on uh, the ones at the VA. Um, knowing how to change those is important. So on the old machines, you would use that module that's right underneath the ultrasound machine. Click that button, and it would change uh, your your uh, probe that you're uh, getting images from. On the newer ultrasound machine, there's a uh, a, a tab up top on the touch screen that says transducers and exams. If you click that, it'll give you all, all the uh, probes with images, so it's pretty easy to, to switch through. The important thing is when you do switch through these, you'll see that the footprint and the image that you're getting changes very significantly. Uh, we'll talk about the footprint going forwards, but that's just something that I use to know what probe is selected, even if I don't know where um, if I've changed them or, or checked them or not. Uh, the next thing is that dot. 
So for I know for first years at least when I was an intern, uh, I would always I would be putting a line in, and my fellow my resident would walk in and be like, "Where's your dot at? Where's your dot at?" And it would just throw me off quite a bit. It's very important to know where your dot is because if you're doing a procedure, your right or left depends on where your dot is placed. So if you don't have the correct orientation, you'll be going right, and your probe uh, will show that you're going left on the screen. Um, just by uh, there are two things that I want you to know about this. One is that there's a corresponding dot on the screen as well that's marked in the red circles there. Um, when you're doing vascular procedures, uh, that dot stays on the same side as your screen as it is on your patient. So if you're doing a line, your dot's on the left, you keep the, the dot on the left on the patient as well, and that way everything lines up. For cardiac ultrasound, almost always the dot's on the right. For lung and abdominal ultrasound or for uh, pleural effusions, it's on the, on the uh, left. Uh, one trick that I've learned, uh, and I teach most of my interns and residents, is that if, when you're starting a procedure off, a lot of times when you put the sterile probe cover on, you're not able to tell where the dot is, or you have to really find it. Uh, and then there are other ultrasound machines which have a completely diff different configuration of a dot. So if you want to know where the dot is, take your probe, put gel on one side of the probe, and if it lights up on the same side as it is uh, as the dot is on the screen, you're pretty good to go. You know that's the, the side uh, where the dot is. If it's the opposite side, flip your probe and you should be good to go. All right, so going to depth. Um, this is important to know because uh, if you want to see the entire object that you're seeing or optimize your image, you got you got to make sure that you can adjust uh, how far uh, you can see. This is adjusting your field of view, basically. Um, the button on the old ultrasound machine is pretty much uh, next to that mouse pad uh, with up and down buttons. And then on the newer machine, you've got the slider on uh, the right-hand side of your uh, screen uh, that you can adjust to... Um, um, get a deeper or uh, a shallower image. Um, so, uh, for example, this is a, I was trying to get an apical four chamber uh, view over here, and you can see, you can only see part of the left ventricle in this, part of the right ventricle, and not a whole lot more. So if you keep, um, before I go to that, there is a red arrow pointing to uh, the 13 number. That's telling you how many centimeters of depth you have. Um, there are two other markers on this. Um, one is marking out, so the, the small space between the two non-bold dots uh, is a centimeter, and then the two bold dot distance is five centimeters. So it kind of gives you a rough idea about how much depth you need. It's also very important, so when you're doing thoracentesis or, or, or paracentesis on obese patients, you want to know how much your needle is going to go into the patient before you start getting pleural fluid, and that can help you sort of gauge uh, how deep you're going to go. So to adjust this image, we'll keep going down on depth. And you can see as we, as we go deeper, we get a pretty uh, perfect image over there where we can see all four chambers of the heart. So you can see the left ventricle, the left atrium, the right ventricle, and the, uh, and the right atrium. Um, there's probably a, a small pericardial fat pad up top. That's why you can see uh, that hy hypochoic area between uh, the myocardium and uh, the pericardium. Um, next thing is gain. So um, gain kind of helps you fine tune your image uh, to get a better visualization of structures around uh, and a better resolution as well. Um, to adjust gain, there are three knobs on the, on the old machine that you would adjust. I would tell you to stick to the bottom one, that's total gain. The other two are far field and near field gain, and I don't think you need to mess around with that as much. You can just do a pretty good job with uh, adjusting total gain. Uh, on the newer machine, you've got a slider at the bottom of the screen, and you can slide that uh, to adjust uh, gain. The same thing is uh, for that one. Once you start sliding it, there'll be two other sliders that pop up. Those are near and far field. I would tell you only to stick to uh, adjusting total gain. To give you an example of what gain does, so if you look at the image uh, on the far left, there's a lot of dark um, areas that you are not very well characterized uh, on that image. And then if you look at the image on the far right, there's lots of bright images that are also not well characterized. So if you adjust your gain properly and get that image in the center, um, that should give you a, a very good image um, of what you're looking at. Um, does anyone know, can I get my mouse over there? What is this structure, guys? Thyroid. Who said thyroid? There you go, that's thyroid. Shruti wants to be an endocrinologist. <laughs> Okay, um, so changing modes. There are four modes um, on the ultrasound. 
Uh, you probably use two of these most often, M mode and 2D, which is B mode. Uh, but I'll go through them briefly just so you guys know uh, what these are. Uh, if you go into cardiology or critical care, you'll probably end up using all four modes uh, quite a bit. And then for vascular ultrasound, we also use uh, the color Doppler feature uh, quite a bit. So just those modes, you use the, um, the buttons on the, on the right of the old machine. And on a newer machine, you've got them on the opposite side. And they're pretty similar. Uh, same thing uh, with uh, those uh, controls. Um, so let's start off with B mode, which is probably the most common mode we use. Um, this is uh, an image of a apical four-chamber view. And you see a very big um, vegetation on the anterior mm -hmm. leaflet uh, of the mitral valve, um, multi-lobulated. Unfortunately, this is a epidemic in where we live. Every Almost every patient we put a probe on uh, who's in the ICU uh, ends up having vegetations or endocarditis. It's uh, pretty, pretty uh, uh, common in where we are. So uh, a lot of times this changes your management completely. Uh, and patients are very asymptomatic from, from this standpoint. Um, the next uh, mode is M mode. Uh, there are two places where you would use M mode a lot. Uh, one is to look at the IVC variation. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, and the second is to look for lung sliding for pneumothorax, and we'll talk about that in a future lecture. So this is an image of uh, the IVC. Um, and you can see that it's very hard to differentiate how much this collapse is. Uh, unless you pause the image and you measure it in the lowest and the, the smallest diameter and the, and the largest diameter and then calculate it. Or if you can, you can put it in M mode. And what M mode does is that line that's on um, the image, it's taking that slice and putting it over time. So you can see what that change in IVC diameter is very well. And you can actually point out that's the minimal and that's the maximal. And those are the two numbers I'm going to use. So this is something we use to, to check for volume responsiveness. It's not the best tool, but it's something that we have as adjunct to other things that we do in the ICU. Uh, so this is something you'll almost everyone will learn when you rotate through uh, medical ICU. Uh, the other one that I talked about was uh, for lung sliding. So a lot of times when we're putting a probe on a patient on their uh, intercostal spaces and we try to look for lung sliding and we don't see a very good slide, uh, you can put an M-mode cursor through it and that can give you, um, a, you can give you a good image of whether there is lung sliding or not. So if things are static, if nothing moves, you get a barcode. You get very straight lines. If things move, you get this kind of white noise um, sort of picture. So in that image of M-mode, you can see... Uh, at the bottom, you've got this sort of white noise, and at, up top, you've got straight lines. This is called a seashore sign, and this tells you that the patient probably does not have a pneumothorax, at least not in the area that you had your probe on. If you were to do this on a patient who had a pneumothorax, you'd see straight lines throughout. Um, so that's an, another uh, important thing that we do uh, in the ICU. Doppler is a, a pulse wave Doppler. Um, it measures the, the velocity of blood flow. Uh, we don't use it very often, not, not at your level at least, but uh, I've been doing a study on this. I think some, some of you guys may have seen me do carotid flow Dopplers uh, to try to see um, volume responsiveness with passive leg raises. Uh, so uh, that's one of the other modes. And then the last one's color Doppler. This uh, is able to tell you direction of flow, uh, and it marks that out with, uh, with color. So uh, not always is blue a uh, vein and red an artery. Just remember that if blue is pulsating, that's not a vein probably an artery. If red is not pulsating, it's probably not an artery, it's a vein. So an important thing about color Doppler, um, if your probe is completely perpendicular to uh, the object that you're imaging, you will get no color. Uh, and the reason, uh, so, so to get color, you actually need to tilt your probe. And so if you tilt your probe a little way and your, uh, the blood is moving away from your probe, it's going to look blue. So in this situation, uh, that vessel underneath that you see Blood is actually moving away from the probe, and it appears blue on the, uh, on the Doppler image. Um, that mnemonic I have up there called BART, so blue away, red towards, that's how we, I was taught to remember it. Um, and so I'll show you an example of that. So if you flip it over, uh, now blood is coming towards your probe. Uh, you haven't changed your orientation or anything else, just tilted your probe uh, the other way. And now that, that vessel that was appearing uh, blue before now appears red and pulsatile. Um, so you can make anything look a different color just by changing the orientation of your probe. So just be careful when you see blue, just don't make sure, uh, make sure it's a vein before you uh, puncture it when you're doing uh, central lines. Questions thus far? No.
Okay. Uh, so moving on to uh, the different transducer probes. Uh, there are three main probes that we use. Um, there are low-frequency probes. Those are the to two low-frequency probes we use, uh, mostly for cardiac, abdominal, um, uh, ultrasound. Uh, we use the same probe for um, looking for pleural effusions, for ascites, um, everything else. The reason we use this probe is because it has better definition of depth. Um, that's the opposite of a high resolution or high frequency probe, uh, which is our vascular probe. This we use for vascular access, for looking for DVTs, and it basically has much better resolution at a shallower depth. So um, when you change probes, you'll see that the corresponding image changes uh, and corresponds to the footprint of your probe. So if you have the, the abdominal probe, which is up top, uh, you see a curvilinear sort of footprint. If you have uh, your vascular probe, uh, which is on uh, the left over there, uh, it will have a flat uh, footprint. This is the same image obtained uh, by three different probes, and you can see how different the res resolution is on each of those probes. So if you were to use a probe to do a vascular procedure, you would use the one that has the best resolution, and that would be your, uh, your high-frequency probe. All right. So going to probe handling, um, this is important to know. So um, when, when I'm teaching you guys ultrasound or someone else is teaching you guys ultrasound, I fail if I'm taking over the probe from you and teaching you what to do. If I can communicate with you without uh, taking the probe from you but telling you what to do with the probe, I feel that I've made some success and you'll learn better. So if I can teach you guys nomenclature and know what the different movements with the probe is or are, um, you'd probably learn uh, a lot better uh, when you're scanning patients live. So there are five uh, main movements uh, that happen with a probe. Um, they're based off of the X or the Y axis. Um, so defining the Y axis, so the orientation marker that you have, the line that's with it or the long axis is actually the Y axis. Um, the, the perpendicular axis to that is the x-axis. Now, uh, movements will happen across these axes, and that will help uh, you differentiate uh, each of them. Uh, so moving on to the first two, uh, so sweeping and sliding. Um, sweeping is when you're moving in the length of your probe. Uh, if you uh, want to give an example of this, it would be when you're mapping the length of a vein when you're doing uh, an internal jugular approach to a central line. So you go from top to bottom, and that's you sweeping the probe. As opposed to sliding, when you're trying to center the vein on your ultrasound image, you're going from side to side with the probe, and that's called uh, sliding. The other two uh, that are in the X and Y axis are rocking and fanning. Uh, so fanning is when you're uh, actually tilting your probe in that X axis. Um, and be careful with this because I've seen a lot of times when you don't have your probe completely perpendicular to it, if you have it tilted a little bit or fanned towards uh, the interior of the patient, you're seeing something that's way beyond where your probe is. So if you try to do a procedure there and you try to find your needle, you're not going to be able to find your needle uh, because it, your probe is actually looking way ahead of uh, where you think your probe is. Uh, fanning is the same movement, but it's in uh, the y-axis. Uh, and this is sometimes used uh, to optimize your image better. It's actually used a lot more in the cardiac and thoracic ultrasound. So when we put our probe and we tilt it down or, or, fan, or, or rock it, we can see more up ahead uh, on an image. The last movement is uh, rotation. Um, this is pretty self-explanatory. You're moving uh, on the axis of the center of the probe. Uh, and so you go from long to short axis or short to long axis. Um, those are rotational movements. Questions thus far? No. So this is the meat uh, of uh, this talk, uh, primarily for first and second years, uh, to teach you guys how to uh, optimize needle control when you're uh, performing vascular procedures in the ICU. Uh, I, I struggled with this a lot. In fact, when I started doing A-lines as a medical student, I would do them by palpation. I got really good at doing them by palpation. And then I start, started residency, and they wouldn't let you use palpation. They would want you to use ultrasound. So it was a, a pretty good learning curve to getting good at it. Uh, and so I'll try to help you um, just start you off uh, with this. The whole point of learning probe control is to be able to track the tip of your needle at all times. So if you watch this video, you'll see that I'm able to track the tip of my needle. That's an ultrasound gel uh, that I made, and uh, you can um, see that I'm going to in in inject some saline uh, into that area, form an abscess. So that's the hypochoic area that you can see. But the point of that is that you can track that needle 
continuously while it's going through. This will prevent you from, from causing trauma to uh, a viscous body or another part of the body that you don't want to be um, uh, poking with a needle. And the second is that you get one, per, one poke um, central lines and arterial lines. So it saves uh, you know, hematomas and other things that would complicate your procedure, make it a little lengthier. Um, so there are six steps that uh, I'll, I'll walk you through uh, to be able to get a, uh, a good um, visualization of your needle and be able to do uh, lines uh, in a better uh, manner. So the first one is to, to probe, uh, place your probe perpendicular to the surface. This is exactly what I was talking about before. If you don't have your probe completely straight or perpendicular to the body, you're looking either away from the probe or... or um, ahead of the probe or before the probe, and, and you're not going to be able to find your needle well because where you're looking is not where your needle is going in. So keep it very perpendicular to uh, the patient's body. Identify where you want to poke. So if you can find a good spot, which we'll talk about in a future lecture, but le for an IJ approach of a central line, you want your carotid and your IJ to be side by side instead of being riding each other. And so once you've found that spot, you're going to hold your probe there, the next step is to enter with the needle, but you enter proximal to where your uh, ultrasound is going. So when I started off, I would enter right where my probe was, and it, it becomes very difficult, and I'll tell you why. So the whole point of doing this is to meet your needle at the place where your ultrasound probe is. And so if you start off where you're going in, you're going to meet your needle way beyond uh, where you want it to be. So if you start off a little proximal, get your needle tip in, the next step is going to be to sweep that probe back towards where the needle is until you can find it. So you put your needle in and now you get your probe backwards and you try to find the tip of your needle. The best way that I've learned to do it is by jigging your needle very slightly. So it's like a 0.5 to 1 millimeter movement that you do with the needle. And when it's in motion, you can actually see the needle tip a lot better um, than what you would. Your needle tip is going to look very hyperechoic. It's a, well, it's a hyperechoic dot. Remember that the shaft of your needle is also going to show up as hyperechoic. So how do you know this is the tip of your needle? Once you've found the tip of your needle and you're confident at it, move your probe away from it and jig it. If you don't see the tip anymore, that probably means that was the tip of the needle and now you, there's nothing ahead of it. If you move your probe up ahead and you still see something moving that's hyperechoic, that's probably the shaft of the needle and you want to find your tip um, further up uh, in the ultrasound. Now that we've found the tip of our needle, uh, we're going to advance our probe by a very, very small distance, 0.5 millimeters to 1 millimeter. Uh, and this is very important. All the movements that you do with ultrasound are very, very fine movements. If you, if you can imagine, the tip of your needle is probably the same a 0.5 or 1 millimeter. So if you keep all your movements very, very fine and small, you'll have much better success of tracking this needle. So once we, uh, once we found the tip of our needle, we're going to move our probe ahead out of the view of the tip of the needle, and then we're going to try to advance that needle, uh, uh, the needle again until we can see the tip uh, under the ultrasound probe. So uh, that way. Now, we're going to keep repeating steps four and five, and we can adjust right and left if we're not aiming directly straight for the vessel. And I'll show you that in a video um, in just in a little bit. Uh, and adjusting um, uh, those, those fine adjustments, again, are important that you have your orientation marker pointed the same way. Because if you're moving, if you see it, your needle's going to the right, and you want to move to the left, if your orientation marker is the opposite way, you're going to go the exact opposite of where you want it to be. So be careful of uh, the orientation marker. Um, and then once you get to your needle, you'll see your needle actually enter. Uh, so I'm going to go through this once more, again, just quickly. Um, so place your probe perpendicular to the patient. Put your needle in proximal to the patient. Get your probe back so that you can find your needle tip. Advance your probe away from your needle tip. Now you advance your needle tip so you can see it again under the ultrasound. Keep doing this movement where you keep getting your probe away from yourself, putting your needle in, going away from yourself, putting your needle in until you get into uh, the blood vessel. Um, this, is, this works best for central venous uh, catheters because your vein is pretty deep in the body. For arterial lines, you don't have a lot of real estate before you go in uh, to, to the artery. So a, a lot of times, what you're doing with an, uh, with an arterial line is finding where you need to go, and if you have it right at the center of the spot and you go in, you should be able to get flash. Uh, questions about this? No. So I'm going to show you a video in which um, I'm doing exactly all those steps again.
Uh, and this is a, this is a, the same ultrasound gel that I made that I used last year for simulation classes. And you'll see I adjusted the probe there towards the left a little bit. I go further down, now I'm going to adjust my needle to the right. And I keep going in until I get to the blood vessel, and then I can see my needle go through that blood vessel. And then I actually get a transverse view right on the side right here where you can see the needle in the blood vessel. So I'll let that play once more. Uh, and we're actually getting towards the end of our lecture, so... Um, Watch that once more, and then I'll have some time for questions. Do you confirm after you put the wire if you were going to confirm, or do you rely on seeing the needle in the vessel before? I would do both. So I, I would. So anytime if you're doing a venous line, before you dilate, um, you check your wire because you don't want to dilate a, a carotid or a femoral artery. You'll be in a lot of trouble. Um, and that's specifically true for uh, if you're doing subclavian uh, lines using ultrasound. You want to make sure that you know where your wire is before you dilate a subclavian artery, which you can't compress. So you're, you're going to have to call a surgeon to, to help you with that. Okay, so here's a, a resource that I want uh, you guys to be familiar with. I use this resource quite a bit. Has anyone heard of the Pocus Atlas or TPA? No. So... Um, all right, so when you go to the POCUS Atlas, um, there are two uh, tabs you'll get. One is an image atlas, and the other is an evidence atlas. So if you want to see, if you do a lot of ultrasound and you're not familiar with what you're looking at, you can actually look it up, or the images on this, and they're actually copyright, or copyright free, so you can actually reproduce these uh, without their permission. Um, the other is the evidence atlas, which I like the most. So if you click on evidence atlas, and then you go down, you can actually choose your subspecialties that you're in. Um, just to start off with pulmonary, it'll give you sensitivities, specificities, likelihood ratios for almost every um, uh, procedure that you do. And you'll see what the reason why I like ultrasound a lot. Every procedure that we do, pulmonary edema, uh, pneumothoraces, pleural effusions, pneumonia, all of them have sensitivities and specificities in the high 80s and 90s. So this tool is so, it's, it's, it's actually sometimes more sensitive and more specific than a chest x-ray at detecting a lot of those things. Um, a chest x-ray is not going to be able to detect a small amount of pleural fluid. You can with an ultrasound. A pneumothorax, a small pneumothorax, you're probably not going to be able to see with a chest x-ray. You can with an ultrasound. Similarly to uh, that for cardiac procedures or cardiac um, um, uh, imaging, um, looking at E-point septal separation, looking for your visual estimation of an EF. So a lot of times um, people will ask me, like, oh, you looked at that image and you said the EF was 30%. Uh, can you do that? And you can, but the sensitivity and specificity is about 80% each. It's not the best, but at least it gets you some sort of an idea uh, of what it is. So I would advise you guys to see if, if you like ultrasound or have an interest in any of the ultrasound heavy um, uh, subspecialties, cardiology, pulmonary, critical care, go through this website, see what, see what the things uh, that interest you are, and you can actually develop your own skills um, using, using the website. Questions? Well, that's it for now, guys. <laughs> <laughs>